Hi, this is Josh Marshall, and this is the Josh Marshall Podcast. You know, today, we, we were talking before we started recording, we're talking about what is the theme of this episode. And the theme of this episode is the looming midterm elections. And we're not really going to, with, with one exception, we're not, we're not going to talk about the electoral part of it, you know, kind of like which are the hot races and which are the, all that kind of stuff. We're going to talk about one race in uh, New Hampshire, but mainly we're going to talk about the climate this has created for Democrats, the mood. And uh, as you may be feeling already, Democrats have a pretty, a pretty bad feeling about, about this midterm election. I mean, in a sense, they've had a bad feeling about it since uh since the 2020 election midterm elections are never great um for the first midterm elections are never great for the incumbent party very very seldom uh do they do they do they turn out well um and uh you know early in joe biden's presidency there was sort of a sense of you know the history the histories against them even if the president is some, you know, is popular, and he was popular, now he's not popular. So the stars are not aligning well for Democrats, and there. So when you have a when you have a moment like that, you have a tendency to get this kind of perverse dynamic where everyone's nervous. And everyone is interpreting the reasons for their nervousness or the bad signs through the prism of their own expectations and their own goals. So you have more, you know, kind of moderate Democrats saying, well, you know, we went too hard on, on Black Lives Matter and, uh, you know, defund the police and all this, you know, all that kind of stuff. The pronouns. We did that too much. We lost... We lost the middle of the country. And you have people on the left saying, uh, you know, we were elected to do big things and we've done nothing. And, uh, you know, the Democrats and Joe Biden built up all these expectations that we were really going to have real reform. And uh, the big bill, nothing happened with it. And here we are. And we've got to get back to that. And then each of these, I think... Um, each of those analyses have some have some merit to them. Uh, what has even more merit is that you've you're still coming out of this pandemic, and everything's kind of broken, and the society is still very upended. And you have these, you know, you know, very real inflation in the economy. And if things are, you know, if things are going up almost 10% a year, people are going to feel that. You certainly see, I mean, I think most of us, it's not that, uh, you know, gasoline is the only thing, the only kind of staple commodity that we buy, but it's very visible. We don't all necessarily know, like, the, there's no uniform price of bread. Right, there's all different kinds of bread. How much a loaf of bread? Well, it depends which loaf of bread you caught, you you buy, and the price of gas, you know, varies regionally. It can even vary depending on what station you go to, but you see it. You know when it kind of it was three dollars and now it's four dollars, and that has become the sort of the symbol of inflationary pr uh, pressures in the economy. And um, I'll be honest with you that I don't. Uh, I do not completely understand uh, myself what seems to be, you know, uh, Joe Biden's pretty, at this point, kind of ingrained lack of popularity, right? Um, but it clearly is the case. And uh, that is just a reality kind of looming over everyone. And yet, what, you know, I did a post this morning, we got a, I, I, I've, We've gotten a number of emails from TPM readers over the last few days that have looked at, you know, looked at this story with Jared, Jared Kushner and, uh, you know, the Saudi crown prince, de facto ruler of the country, Mohammed bin Salman. 
looked at that, looked at other stories, you know, the fact that we're in almost in a quasi war with Russia, which has been like the, the most favored country of the Republican Party for the last seven years. Why? Like, OK, now everybody hates Vladimir Putin. It, why are we talking about the fact that that he was your guy's biggest buddy until a week ago? Is do we just forget about that? And so uh, this reader this morning, along with, you know, kind of a number of readers, are like, why are we talking about this more? What's going on? Like, you know, I, I don't think these people are under the illusion that 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 will suddenly make the Democrats super popular and like, you know, they'll have like a, a, a resounding victory in the midterms. But you. You do what you can. And when there's something just sitting there kind of on the table, why aren't you using it? And when partisans say things like that, often the issue is, you know, you're in your own sort of partisan democratic world, and not everybody is that upset about that thing you think that everybody should be upset about. In this case, though, I don't, I'm not sure that's quite it. That doesn't, that's not quite a complete explanation. I do think there is a there is this kind of pall over the Democrats. Like we are all just sort of moving towards this very bad thing. And it kind of is what it is. And there's not a lot we can do about it. And that perception at some level is kind of true, I think. You know, the things that are afflicting the country, the things that are afflicting uh, the Democratic Party, the president, et cetera, there's no there's no f- switch that we can flip at the moment and make gas prices go down to what they were in 2019. And we even at the best uh, you know predictions we c- we can't make inflationary pressures you know leave the economy. Uh, we can't there's all sorts of things that are that really are kind of if not baked in they're looking like they're going to be baked in you just you can't undo those things through some like political feat of strength having said that though you do what you can and um there does seem to be a lot of that not happening and there's so there's kind of a disconnect like again to me you know I expect there. I expect the Democrats to have a pretty bad result in November. I'm not saying. I'm not saying. I'm not saying my expectation is right. I'm not saying it can't be changed. But that that's my expectation. But you you come out and you play hard in the fourth quarter, no matter what, right? Because because you don't know what's going to happen, and you just kind of do you you do that uh, on principle frankly, you come out and you play for the fourth quarter and you play hard no matter what, partly because that's just, if you play football, that's what you do. You don't give up in the fourth quarter, even if you're down. And you also do it because you don't know the future, right? And you do, you, you give it everything you have and you see where it comes out. And, uh, so that is kind of, we're seeing a lot of that. And um, and I I do think there is a um, there's something out there right now among and and when I say democratic partisans in this in this context I don't mean that in a you know we tend to use the word partisans in a kind of a denigrating way in in contemporary political discussions oh there's you know people who are I don't know calling it calling balls and strikes, and there's partisans. Partisan just means you're engaged in the process. You have a set of beliefs, and you are engaged with that set of beliefs. Um, but I think there's something out there right now for Democrats of this kind of disconnect. Like, we have a story to tell here, and we should tell it. Even if it's not going to make the hugest difference in the world, we need to tell our story. And there, I mean, from my point of view, there is a story here. I mean, we have the stuff happening right now in Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine is its own story. You know, 
that's a Ukraine story. It's a story for the people in Ukraine, right, who are, who are living under bombs falling down on them. But it's not, sim- it's not only a Ukraine story. It's part of a whole transnational story that is about uh, revisionist powers and authoritarianism. And that is connected to, you know, uh, Jared Kushner and MBS. You know, the two billionaire or would-be billionaire princelings who are running this kind of uh, alternative world order that maybe now is the real world order. Kind of that doesn't that that is moving into the future without sort of the simple stuff like you know civic democracies. So there's a story to tell, and I do think people are getting start. There are some Democrats, maybe a lot of Democrats, who are starting to get a little antsy of like we need to tell our story, even if even if that's not going to change everything. What's wrong? Why aren't we telling our story? There's a story to tell us. It's, it's not just that it might be politically advantageous to us. It's actually what's happening. And why aren't we telling it? So that is what uh, we are going to talk about today. Uh, before we get further into that, let me remind you, spring, your nose is running, your eyes are watering, and you can't stop sneezing. But the first real sign of spring is the feverish return of your iced coffee cravings. And if you blew through your summer iced coffee budget before the first 80-degree day, that coffee addiction is like an itch you can't scratch. Well, Grady's Cold Brew has just what the doctor ordered. Each all-in-one cold brew beanbag kit makes you 36 cups of craving-quenching iced coffee for less than a buck a cup, ready to give your sip ready to sip your way through spring without guilt of $6 iced coffees, go to Grady'sColdBrew.com and save 25% with promo code TPM. That's Grady'sColdBrew.com, and you get 25% off with promo code TPM. So, uh, Kay Riga, what do we got today? Yeah, so on the kind of Democratic problem, I do think to some degree there are two different buckets of problems that are being conflated and is making everything feel very impossible to Democrats. Because on the one hand, you have the policy problem, right, which is due to the obstinance of Republican senators and the filibuster in the Senate, passing stuff is basically impossible right now. And I think to a lesser degree, you have the problem that we have this very activist very conservative Supreme Court. And I do think that's putting the brakes on some stuff that people want Biden to do unilaterally, because there's some political consideration of, you know, how does it look if he, with a with a single pen strike, cancels all student debt, and then the Supreme Court says, no, you can't do that. So I, I think that is all going on over there. And then the other problem is the messaging problem. And I think a lot of times, Democrats think those two things are totally intrinsically linked, which sometimes, of course, you know, they are. Look at Obamacare. But sometimes they're very much not. And I think Build Back Better is a place where, I don't know, if even if it had passed, if that was going to be a guaranteed instant booster to Democrats, because a lot of that stuff would have taken a while to kick in. And that's not something people would have immediately recognized. And while I generally think that's a bad thing that allows for Republicans to basically do have no legislative agenda and still win elections, the upside of it is there is room to run on the messaging side when you're having trouble on the policy side. And I think that's kind of where Democrats should be concentrating their focus and I think like you say it's because there is a story to tell there's a really compelling story about this global battle of democracy versus authoritarianism of of freedom versus control and luckily for Democrats we've got a microcosm of that battle happening in the United States right now with basically every culture war item that Republicans are choosing to fight over really condenses down to control, you know, control of what books people can read, control of how parents should parent their children, uh, you know, even physical control of, of trade at the southern border with Greg Abbott's whole shenanigan. So I think they can really kind of lean into that and say, hey, we're the party of Ukraine, we're the party of freedom, and capitalize on that a little bit more, which also has the dual benefit of being true even while they're struggling with the policy parts, which is just 
it's just such a bummer to and so discouraging to Democrats. And I don't know that there's a lot of political juice to be gotten at this moment from doing the whole, you know, maybe we'll pass this tax credit at some point in the future. I think instead shift and, and take a little from the Republican playbook of capitalizing on emotions and not so much legislative agenda and, and run Harvard into that because that's true. And that's also the reason why Biden won in 2020. So we know it's got juice. Now, let me ask you a question because I, cause I had not heard specifically about the idea. I mean, I know all about the student debt uh, mm-hmm. forgiveness issue and how that is, you know, a huge issue for a lot of, for a lot of people. Um, but I hadn't heard specifically the idea that they might be holding back on doing it because they're afraid they're going to get overruled by the Supreme court. Now, to me, frankly, I, you know, if he does it and if he does it great. And if the Supreme court says it's legit, fantastic. If the Supreme court says it's not legit, Politically, I don't see how that's a bad thing. I mean, yeah. frankly, that seems like a great thing. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, because I'm a, a, still a bit of a traditionalist. I would say if you really don't think it's if if it's legit, you can't do it. I don't think you can do something you know is not legit and just have the Supreme Court backstop it to, you know, to beat up on them. Mm-hmm. But if it is within the president's power by a reasonable estimation and it's good policy, Go ahead and do it. And then if the Supreme Court, I mean, you want to you want to get people rel- revved up about the Supreme Court. If if, you know, if all the people under 35 suddenly have their financial futures, you know, dramatically changed, and everybody's excited. And then it's like, wah, wah, wah. You know, if it, if it's Amy Coney Barrett saying, sorry, sorry. I mean, I don't see I mean, I know that there's a certain mentality and I think this is what you're describing from others who are talking this way, who think, well, if that happens, that'll make, um, you know, that will make Biden seem weak or ineffectual. And I don't see it that way. Frankly, I don't see it that way at all. Not in the least. Um, it, it, again, it, it, it sort of it sort of depends on how you react to it. But, you know, one of the things, you know, it's funny. I, uh, you know, we have the New York Post here in our neck of the woods, and it's always a kind of a funny thing because it's very much a New York tabloid, and yet it's very right wing. When you know, there, there's there's there is a a there's definitely a pretty big political spectrum in New York City, but it's all kind of you know moved over towards the leftward uh, uh, side of things, you know, relative to the rest of the country. Um, and you see these headlines like the the immigration avalanche, the immigration, the Biden immigrant, you know, feral hordes, horde, whatever, right? All the, all this kind of stuff. And uh, obviously, to the extent that the immigration, you know, people coming over the border, whether it's arrests or not, or you know. It's kind of all, always a simple thing when the Republicans are like, so many people are being arrested at the border. Well, OK, I mean, what what they're being arrested? What, what you know, what more right. do you want? Shall we fling wide the doors? Is that what you Yeah, prefer? yeah. What's what's the issue? But but having said all this, um, you know, you have this thing where the, there were the same numbers were happening under Trump. It's just that Trump was constantly saying, I'm I'm focused on hurting them. I want to hurt them so bad. And he kept doing stuff to do that. And he'd get overruled by the courts. Then he'd try to find another thing to, over, you know, to do. And he'd, in most cases, get overruled by the courts again. But the point is, is that that, sir, I don't think that ever hurt him in terms of like, oh, he's weak because the courts are, are, are overruling him or something like that. That's not how it works, especially, especially, um, it depends on how you react to it because he didn't react to it by like, Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I thought, I thought why well, I was doing okay, but now you've made it clear. It's not okay. So I'm really sorry. You know, you, I don't expect any democratic president to, um, you know, to, to, to try to, um, you know, ignore the courts, but you try again. You say, you know what? I just, dis- I disagree. Your, that's your decision to make. I'm going to try another way to. I'm going to try another way to do it. And even if, even if you don't end up getting 
the policy, at least everybody knows who, which side you're on. No question. And they know what side the Supreme Court's on. So I think you are, I, I, unfortunately, I suspect you are right that, that they may be holding back because of that, right? That they may be uh, saying, well, I don't know if we can do it, if we're just going to get uh, over by the Supreme Court. But man, if that's the case, the people, we need, we need, we need better White House people <laughs> because that's stupid. Because again, look, the Supreme Court, the current Supreme Court is deeply politicized and deeply corrupt, deeply corrupt. And you still have a lot of people in the sort of the old school mode, like, oh, you, you don't want to damage the legitimacy of the court by criticizing it too much. The current court is not legitimate. It has, factually, it is not. And we need people to know that. And, that's, and, and we need to get back to talking about reforming the court, expanding it, blah, 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 all these kind of things. So how can it be a bad thing to take something of great value to a significant part of the population and a part of the population is going to be voting for decades into the future right. to put a thing of great value in front of them and have the Supreme Court say, take it back away. Now, it would be one thing if if you're kind of scamming people like, you know, you're never they're never going to get it. And it's not even legitimate what you're doing or something like that. So you're kind of pulling a fast one. You're not pulling a fast one. If you think it's legitimate by sort of a reason, reasonable constitutional analysis, you do it. And you think, you know, and you think it's the right thing to do on policy terms, do it. And if the Supreme Court wants to jump in and take it away, let them do it. That's not fooling anybody. That's not that's not playing fast and loose. But it, it's a demonstration case of one of the central points of democratic uh, politicking and, and policy work now, that the Supreme Court is the problem. And yeah. not just the problem, the corrupt problem. Yeah, I mean, two points on this. One, with student debt in particular, I have been wondering if they're saving it to cancel student debt or, you know, cancel some amount of student debt right before the midterms to try to inject some energy before it just fades into the other news cycle. Yeah. But on the the bigger Supreme Court piece, I think is really important because if that's factored into the discussion at all, kind of fear of the student of the Supreme Court knocking down Biden's thing and, and any fear of him looking like a, a loser or weak or whatever. I mean, we got to get used to it because this court <laughs> is going to be a primary antagonist for Democrats for unfortunately probably decades. And we're about to embark upon the the real cases that start taking away rights, you know. So far it's kind of been prelude. It's been you listen to the oral arguments and get a sense of which way they're going. It's less lower profile cases kind of thing. But we're getting into the row. We're getting into gun stuff. We're going to be probably soon after that getting into relitigation of same-sex marriage and contraception, other privacy rights. I mean, this is going to be a big thing. And I think it's a real mistake for Democrats to kind of like cower around being afraid to criticize the court or God dealing with it like they did with the whole Ginny Thomas stuff, this kind of, oh, we're going to hold our nose and don't want to hurt the court's legitimacy. Come on. They're, they're poised to unravel all the civil rights gains of the last century or to at least weaken them. I mean, the, and the best way you react to that is, again, you take a page out of the Republicans' playbook and you say, we've got an activist court that is threatening things you hold dear. Make that your electoral carrot. And in the meantime, do a lot of stuff quickly, you know, you just write unilateral executive orders left, right, and sideways. That stuff takes a while to get to the court, you know. Even in the meantime, you can at least get caught trying. Well, and the key is the be the the best thing, the best imaginable scenario for the conservative legal movement is that Democrats in power don't even try to do things. Right. Is because they're because they're afraid of what the, what the court will do. Then you get none of the blowback. In fact, the blowback goes to Democratic politicians who, you know, the, 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 there's there's the, the, it, it is just a classic case of internalizing the, you know, internalizing the abuse, for lack of a better word. 
Um, so that is just that is just crazy. And if you want, you know, we have there's that, you know, kind of constant refrain, which is true as far as it goes. Um, you know, you very politically focused people are very hyped up about the Supreme Court, uh, but most people are concerned about gas prices and, you know, whether they have health care and all these kind of things. Well, you cannot, um, you know, were there uh, soon will be uh, worried that they can't, you know, there's no longer uh, contraceptives available at the local CVS or something like that. You cannot expect people who are not hyper political, politically focused to focus on the Supreme Court if it never obviously affects them. Right. <laughs> so, you know, it, it just. If, if that is the resistance, that is just so crazy. And again, you're, it's, it's back into. It's back into operating on this model like we are still have the Supreme Court that we had in the 1960s or 1970s or even 1980s, right, um, where, you know, broadly speaking, the Supreme Court seems to be operating, you know, there are conservatives and liberals, but it's, they're at least operating in, um, in some identifiable jurisprudential framework right kind of uh, a, a a a a a you know a a more um you know kind of stick to the letter of the text version evolving constitution blah 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 not just kind of like we're just kind of connecting the dots to help the republican party at this point which is really what this is um and still in that you know uh, you know, you don't want to damage the legitimacy of the court. You don't want to kind of, you know, politicize it. You don't want to criticize it too much. Or in this case, maybe, you know, it, that it's wrong to um, to try to do things you think the court will oppose. Now, in the old days, that the, there, might be, there might be the idea that the Supreme Court is the, is the body that decides what's constitutional. And if you know they're going to say, say it's unconstitutional, you shouldn't do it because that's, you know, but that never made sense, frankly. Um, it certainly doesn't make sense now. Yeah, and I just think the Supreme Court could actually be a really useful tool for Democrats because it, it encapsulates a lot of the story they have to tell that we've been discussing, which is this uncontrollable, you know, body of nine people who are making, who are probably about to be making decisions about cutting off rights to tons of Americans and five of the six members that encompass the conservative majority were put into place by presidents who lost the popular vote. I mean, I really think there is an argument to be made there that fits into this bigger framework of what Democrats should be doing, which is this ultimate battle for freedom and for democracy. And Republicans ran on that specifically in regards to the court and row for a long time, you know, that was a key thing with Trump with people who, you know, at least claimed to not want to vote for him, but then said, you know what, he's going to put Supreme court justices on the bench. So I'll, I'll hold my nose and do it. And I think to some degree that that proved to be successful. I think that playbook could be flipped. And I just think, I, I wonder if Democrats are still feeling burned from build back better. And from the fact that I think they, wanted to get caught trying and get caught succeeding and it it was so catastrophic i mean it ended up just being months of demoralization for the base that ended up with absolutely nothing and i think there is this fear to do things in public again out of the concern that it'll be such a failure but in this in that case, the, the fundamental problem was we didn't yet know that Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema would be actively working against the party. That was a revelation for everyone. Here, it's pretty clear the Supreme Court's going to be working against Democrats. So you, you, you know the entities, right? So kind of craft your plan, do it. And then when the Supreme Court says no for whatever reason, you get to be like, we were trying to help people. We'll keep trying to help people. The court is in your way. The Trump appointed court is what's in your way. Well, and it's it it it's fundamentally different in the sense that, you know, the the, the problem, a big problem with um 
you know, modern gridlock politics is you there there is just no way and in some sense there's there's no way to get non politically focused people to look at look at the fine print and see that democrats are not passing anything because republicans will not let them pass anything they are the problem um the, the you know i think the rejoinder to that is well you know, Democrats could have gotten rid of the filibuster and passed on 50 votes. So, but, you know, it's, but the point is, is that these kind of intricacies, that's not, you know, that's the fine print. And at some level, it really is the fine print. You elect people. If nothing happens, you figure, you decide that kind of, okay, that didn't work. And, and you know, the other point is, well, you know, if you just a lot... If you only um, elect 50 Democratic senators, that's really not enough. And it's not really enough, right? You need that, 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 that's, that's, that is an impossibly thin uh, uh, margin. But for all of that, what, you know, what do you have to show for it? Well, if you have nothing to show for it, that's a problem. That is not the same as saying, you know, with an executive order, look, it's done. We did it. You know. Congress, president, whatever, kind of like the, the person at issue did it. Now, now we're going to see some litigant from, or maybe the state of Tennessee, bring a suit that you should still have to pay your your student debt. Okay, great. Let's see what the Supreme Court has to say. That's just fundamentally different because the whole thing about modern gridlock politics is you don't. The, the, accountability, power and accountability are just not connected. The one group which is accountable is not the one that has the power, and the one that has the power is not accountable. So it's just a, it's a, it's a perfect recipe for, uh, for dysfunction, and, and Republicans have been taking advantage of it for the last, you know, uh, basically since Obama. It was, different, it was a bit of a different world in the 90s for a number of, mm -hmm. of different reasons, not least of which is that the Republicans did have a legislative agenda back then where they don't now. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, I can't get past this. I mean, this is, you know, I, I, I still think the... Um, th there are some complexities to the debt relief issue and some of that has to do with you know different parts different parts of student debt were um were organized differently even though it's this, you know kind of you 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 got a you know type b you know one type alone another type mm -hmm. alone it was just purely a choice when you're you know kind of signing up for financial aid um in fact in terms of the legal machinery they're very different in terms of whether they can be forgiven or not. So there's all these kind of complexities in there, but whatever, decide what you can do and do it. Toss it exactly. to the Supreme Court. Exactly. I mean, and I, I just think like you say, you know, the, Tennessee brings the suit and we have this big showdown in front of the court that is going to affect the financial health of a huge part of the democratic voting base. I mean, putting aside the it's a we shouldn't penalize people for being educated but back on the you know the kind of political punditry side and then you have say they shoot it down say the conservatives say he doesn't have the power to do that which would be very in line with their aggressively anti-agency stance they've taken then you say you guys want to get rid of your student debt you got to elect democrats so we can put more liberals on the bench you know you get into even if you're too afraid to get into court reform which i by the way think is a dumb thing to be afraid of but even if you are you just say that you don't have to go into the like you say you don't have to go into the fine print you know you don't have to talk about well, that some of the conservatives are young some of them are old so it still works either way yeah no there's there's definitely there uh, there are several of them that are old enough let's put right. it that way um th you know the other thing is that it's not just you know doesn't just have to be by executive order you can do it through congress too right so i mean now are, are you close to having a big enough majority to, but whatever, that, that's the fine print, man. You know, you, you just, this is why you elect Democrats. We're, you know, Supreme Court is the enemy here and it is the enemy. It, you know, and, and uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
my concern with Congress, which is my concern with, I don't know if you've seen, there have been some kind of rumblings about a renewed Build Back Better type situation. My concern is that I think the worst thing Democrats could do right now is enter into another protracted congressional negotiation that everyone is like, well, no, 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 Man- maybe Manchin's on board this time. And it, and we end up doing the exact same thing. That is bad. I think what Democrats need to do right now is action because through, honestly, almost no fault of the Biden administration, they've been forced to be reactive for months. And that is just the nature of dealing with a pandemic, the economic fallout, and a major war all at the same time. But I think a flurry of action of them saying, we're here for you. We're trying to expand your rights. is just, it's the right note to hit. And that's why I'm kind of leaning in the executive action category, even though, you know, I, I get all the arguments. It's less binding. It's vulnerable to the courts. I know Biden personally doesn't like it because he's, you know, a Senate guy, but the congressional path just seems so narrow to me right now. And I think Cinema had some statement the other day where she was like, oh, if we start up negotiations again, I'll be the same person I was before. Great. Yeah, I saw okay, that. I like, believe what she's saying. You. Fuck you. Yeah. I, yeah totally. Yeah. But she's saying that's what she's going to do. That's what they're going to do. So we got to do something else. Yeah. No, to me, like, if you get it all packaged and ready to go, fantastic. But why go through that? You know, and, and you know, the other part is, you know, when you get into you know, legislative deliverables and the political consequences of it. Like, let's say, um, you know, alternative universe. Next week, you pass Build Back Better. Everybody's on board, good to go. Now, will it, will suddenly everybody support the Democrats and Democrats are going to have a great midterm? Probably not. You know, I don't see that as at all a game changer right now. But, but both in the short term and in the medium term, if you were supporting Biden and support, you know, the kind of the build back better, you were kind of behind that. If it passes, if you look back on what you did in 20, you know, in 2020, the election 2020, you can say, okay, we got clobbered in 2022. But you know what? That law is on the books. So did it, did it save 2020? 2022? No. But all the work I did in 2020, that's the payoff. That happened. And to a great extent, in some ways in the short term, but certainly in the medium term, that pays a big political dividend. Because even, you know, one thing, I remember telling people this back in the 2010 cycle, and and this was when Democrats had a it, you know, temporarily had a veto-proof, uh, uh, filibuster-proof majority in the Senate. 60 seats, 60 seats, right? A big majority in the House. And the question is, and people are like, oh, you know, do we really want to force Obamacare through now? That's, uh, you know, it was a similar kind of thing with Build Back Better, except it did get done, right? Um, you know, Obamacare is already unpopular, blah, 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 blah. And you tell people, you get big majorities so you can do big things. You don't get big majorities to hold on to big majorities. The whole the whole the logic of politics has to be that you you get big majorities to do things. Now ideally, you get big majorities to do things that then entrench your majorities because they're popular. But certainly you're not getting big majorities to hold on to them. And so again, the I think to the extent you know the the feeling of the feeling of disillusionment, demoralization now is it is not just the expectation of what happens in 2022. It's the feeling that you know even though you know a lot of people are not at fault that at the end of the day you put in all this work and and the you didn't you didn't get the big stuff done. So what was it for? Now, what is it for? You don't always get what you want. But people are going to ask that and that's very demoralizing if you say we you know we kind of gave it our all and 
you know, kind of beyond all expectations. We actually came through at the end with these two Georgia Senate seats and we didn't get it done. That's that's that just kind of it's not just demoralizing it. It short circuits for people. The sense that there is some connection between their exertion, their electoral successes and things happening that change that change things in the country. And that's very that's very dangerous for a political party to allow that to happen. Yeah, no, that's true. I just don't, I don't know the way around it. You know, I don't, people like to say things like, well, there are 50 votes for these climate provisions. Are there? I mean, in theory, there were 50 votes for Build Back Better until Joe Manchin decided that his way of being a centrist was going to be to embarrass his party on the most protracted and public stage possible. So, you know, I, I just think the other reason why I, I am attracted to this idea of, you know, doing student debt uh, through executive action or kind of anything else that strikes that same note of we see the gaping economic inequality in this country and we're trying to do something about it is because even during this countrywide malaise we're in right now, there is an explosive, energetic, once in a generation labor movement going on as seen in the unionization of, you know, the Amazon warehouses and the Starbucks and all of that. And I think that energy is real. You know, it's pulsating, it's spreading. And I think any way that Democrats can kind of hitch their wagon to that and say, we see this happening and, and we want to help it along is a good thing. And the problem is now, of course, they've got a pro act that would make unionization easier and they, which would be a, a lovely dovetail to say that they passed. But I imagine the reason it hasn't passed yet is because there aren't 50 votes for it or because it would be filibustered and can't get into reconciliation. So I just think we're at the point where you, you just got to be creative. You got to circumnavigate Congress, you know, and, and be shown doing something else. Yeah. When I, when I said the, all the demoralizing aspects of build back better going down in flames, I wasn't saying I, I'm agreeing with you. I'm I, to me, I, I'm not saying like you got to focus on the legislative track and forget about executive orders from where we are right now. I agree 100%, 100%. Um, and in terms of passing kind of like little segments of Build Back Better, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you come up with a press conference, say, here's the bill. We're all on board. Awesome. Awesome. Do it. Do it. That's fantastic. Whether it, whether it affects the political climate or not, whatever, get it done, especially climate, since as we know, uh, you, you know, you, you can... You cannot have, uh, you, you, you know, you can have no labor movement for 100 years and the world will get by. You can't, you're, you're on a hard deadline with the climate stuff. It has to happen. Um, and I'm only picking labor, you know, totally. the unique nature of, 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 the, of the climate issue. Um, but yeah, at, at, at this point, um, anything about we're going to talk it through, no, you're not going to talk it through. No, you're not. I don't want to do that. And and frankly, the, the, there there was you know there was that there was that kind of conversation in late 2021 about well you know the, the first year is really kind of an arbitrary deadline. You can do it in the second year, and that's not true. As we have seen, you're getting less popular in the nature of things. And now you've got you know we should we should uh, talk about Maggie Hassan here. We're about to uh, finish up. Uh, you've got people who were on board, but now they're looking at bad, you know, they're looking at tough reelections and suddenly they're not on board. It does not get easier. And, uh, you know, there we are. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about New Hampshire because I think oddly a big glimmer of hope for Democrats on a very grim landscape of 2022 is kind of encapsulated in this race, which really boils down to issues with Republican recruitment, which I'm starting to see as unless there's some kind of super quick turnaround with like COVID and the, and the economic fallout, the biggest hope Democrats have to not get absolutely slaughtered, which is in New Hampshire, all the eggs were in the basket of Chris Sununu to a lesser degree, maybe Kelly Ayotte, even though she was beaten by Hassan in 2016. But they really wanted Sununu to to run. He's super popular. Um, he's you know he's got name recognition from his family in this old state. political family in the state. Exactly. Yeah. And they, you know, they 
McConnell went to him. Rick Scott went to him. They really seemed to think that he was going to run. And not only did he say he was not going to run, he kind of included a little jab at the Senate on his way out, basically saying, oh, I don't want to sit around and do nothing, which... And the, the, the other jab there was that he didn't tell them in advance. And that's yep. just kind of like, that's really a betrayal, right? You have to do, if you don't want to run, you don't run. And if you need to say something, you say it. But you don't, it, it's, it's really slipping a knife to your political compatriots not to even give them a heads up. Hey, I'm doing this tomorrow. I'm not changing my mind. Just don't want to be surprised. I, this is what I got to do. Okay. But as we, as it seems, he just did it and they had no, that was the first they heard of it. And I mean, if that's happening on the other side of the aisle, you'd be thinking like, fuck that dude. Totally. Fuck that dude. Right. Well, they didn't give him a heads up and he dragged out the decision for like months, which means that now these backbenchers who are running have had really no time to try to increase their name recognition because the race was frozen waiting for him to get in because he was going to be the obvious front runner. So, you know, he's done pretty much the most damage to his party in this race that is possible to do. And, and the, it's all, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, it's, 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 it's also a small state. So there's never in New Hampshire, there's never, there's never a big bench. You right. know, you have this massive state legislature, which has like 400 people. It's like, it's pulling a number out of my hat, but it's like, you know, each representative, you know, represents a neighborhood, basically. This is so small. So those people are all like, you know, it's part time. None of them have any blah, 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 you know, name recognition. You've got the two House seats, the two Senate seats and the governor. And like, if you're not one of those, you know, you kind of have to go from a House seat or something. There's just there's just not a it's a it's a small place. Right. So it's not like it's not like in California, say, or even in a, like Pennsylvania, where you got a lot of you got at least a dozen members of the house you've got some state other statewide elected offices you got some mayors you know a lot of people who are kind of in the mix it just you know and ha half the people ever in elected office in new hampshire are named sununu right right so if that if that group is out you're already you know it, it, it's and and it's funny because you know so the to segue here because we, we 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 got collectively so focused on 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 uh what what they're thinking about supreme court and debt relief uh you have this pattern now where you know donald trump just made it official with jd vance in ohio now <laughs> in ohio you got these you know you got him and this josh mandel guy jo josh both like total freaks and posers and and down the line trumpers but Vance has been doing poorly. He's been behind. And and Trump is behind him now. So, like, he's coming into a lot of races and endorsing people who are not obviously winners. And that's – so that's another thing we're kind of like – is that could, that could very well end up down to the benefit of Democrats – because either you just have a kind of a, a, you know, a really brutal race where one person slips through, but they're damaged, or you got some just like complete freak, right? right? Who gets the, who, who gets the, uh, who gets the uh, nomination and, and, you know, the Ohio one, I mean, I, I think I, and I, I think most people see, you know, Ohio is a, is a tough slog for Democrats at this point. It's not really a swing state, but it's not impossible. You know, Sherrod Brown gets reelected there, and there's certainly a lot of Democrats. And the, you know, the 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 people running are are they're all pretty weird. And then you've got you know Greitens in Missouri, my home state. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, I guess he got off on a technicality after he like took his girlfriend into a, like a dungeon and like you know held her captive and took naked pictures of her. I mean, how how is this person still running? Right. And now his 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 uh, his ex-wife came or I guess she didn't come forward. I guess her the what divorce proceedings were released yeah. or something like that. And, you know, accuse accusations of spousal abuse, you know, domestic violence, whatever. Um, you know, I think all journalists are rightly always very hesitant about things that come up in divorce proceedings because. Lots of things get said that you can't, you know, 
can't take it face face value, but I mean, it's on brand, right? So, and, and, uh, I, I know that, that it's not even a matter of mainstream Republicans, just Republicans who like winning elections have been really trying like, all right, let's find someone else, but this dude, I mean, this should be, we should own Missouri Senate seats at this point. Why would we, you know, why would we give the shot to this guy who could easily lose it? So there is, you know, and it, it, it is, uh, it's not unlike what, you know, what may happen in 2022 in the Senate is, is not unlike what happened in 2010 and 2012, where, uh, you know, Republicans had a big wave in 2010, but they did not pick up the Senate largely because they, they nominated a lot of just complete freaks who, who lost elections they should have won. And they didn't have the same wave in 2012, but 2012 was six years after 2006 Democratic wave election. So it was a good map for them, even though they didn't have, you know, the same, the same wave themselves. And they came short again, it took them until 2014 to, uh, to take the Senate. So that can happen with Republicans, right? And uh, it, it, it already seems to be happening. I don't think there's much question it is happening. The question is whether the wave is going to be big enough that kind of even the freaks will get elected. Right. And again, there's only a 50-50. So it's not like they need to like pick up three seats. They need to just, just win one net seat. So, right. um, but you know, who knows? But it is, it is entirely a, a kind of self-created Republican problem that obviously Trump is behind, but so is McConnell to a very large degree, which is Trump is the reason why we're having all these like weird bruising Republican primaries where the guy that he's elected is a weirdo or is not doing that well and throws the whole case into or the whole race into chaos. But then McConnell and his rendering of the Senate, a place where nothing ever happens, where no kind of anyone who is inspired by the public service part of Congress is not going to want to go there. And that has had huge knock on effects, too, because that's why you've got Sununu and Larry Hogan and all the kind of more rational Republicans being like, why in the world would I want that job? Not, you know, you just got to sit around and ask if you agree with Trump about things. <laughs> you know, that's not very attractive to people anymore. So really, they have worked together to create what could be the biggest potential downfall to Republicans in this very friendly environment. Yeah. And, and, and I think for, you know, for a Hogan or a Sununu, in some ways, the model you want to look at is like Mitt Romney, right? You know, I mean, it's not, he gets, you know, some favorable mentions in the op-ed pages of the big city papers and MSNBC, but in reality, it's pretty thankless. Totally. He, you know, he's just kind of like, treated as a, tra a traitor among Republicans and, you, you know, and nothing is, he's not actually passing anything. And he, you know, so like, why kind of, why would you do that? Um, yeah. So should we do one question since we're kind of, all right, we're, yeah. we're let's do one on time? question. Okay. Um, this is from Kim and she asks, is it possible for a higher level elected official? She said, she's thinking a uh, house rep, Senator, president to be, a businessman and not be subject to a conflict of interest. Uh, she said what spurred her to ask that is that she didn't realize Manchin was actually in the coal business. Um, so let's take that part of it first. Is it possible for a high up national elected official to have to be a business person without that being a conflict of interest? Uh, I would say it. it is, you know, I, the, the, the big issue is that there's no official definition of a conflict of interest. Um, it's a, just a concept. And I would say if you are actively in business, like if you are actually like directly deriving money and even like managing a business, no, how, how can you? Because everything comes before, everything comes before Congress. Um, you know, the fact that uh, coal is so, you know, coal wouldn't have been as big a deal 50 years ago. It's just coal. I mean, you know, like wheat or something kind of, it is what it is. What's the controversy? Obviously it's very controversial now. Um, look, there's a reason why, uh, you know, we don't really have good or even any real laws on this in the Senate. There, there's, there's certain things in, in very specific cases, but as far as I know, there's no rules about, you know, you can't, be in the Senate and, uh, you know, be running an airline 
it, you know, doesn't seem wise, but there's no real rule against that. Um, and there's a reason why uh, up until Trump, it was kind of a given. If you you know, if we let you become president, you got to kind of cash out of the business world. You don't have to give up your money, but you at least have to kind of sign it over to, you know, a trust or something, you know, something like that. Put your peanut farm in a blind trust or the like. Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 I, and in most cases, you've dealt with people who either have no, no wealth to speak of, the Clintons when they were in office, Obama when, he, you know, before and when he, was, when he was in office. I mean, his wife had a, had a, you know, reasonably high-paying legal job, but I think she gave that up when she became first lady. Or there are people who kind of, you know, like low-level plutocrats, like the Bushes, who, you know, they're not kind of like running one business. They just got a lot of investments and stuff like that. And so they can, you know, kind of bundle it up into a blind trust and hand it over to someone. You know, if someone, if if I ran for office and I said, oh, I'll put TPM into a blind trust. Well, that's not going to do it. I mean, it's too, it's too specific, right? You, if you're a, if, if you're kind of that directly involved in business, it's kind of impossible. But I, I think the answer is to your question, no, you, you, you can't. Uh, but there are certain things that are more that are more problematic than others. And at this point, running being in the coal business is about as problematic as you can get, considering how how um, central it is to the political questions of the day. Yeah, I mean, I'm radical on this question philosophically. You know, I think part of the reasons why we should have robust public financing of campaigns is because having our government almost entirely run by rich people is really bad. And we see the the results of it being really bad, which is, you know, you have everything from the out of touch level to the, they've got connections with lobbyist level. I mean, I think it's bad on every single level. So I think not only should they not be business people, I think, you know, we should pay, pay lawmakers enough that that's their, their sole gig and that they should have been elected without having any personal wealth or connections. Um, but you know, that's in kind of Kate's utopia America. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, look, if people have if people have wealth, whatever, that's our system. Um, but that's different from being actively engaged in a specific business. And should you not be allowed to be engaged in a business, you know, freedom, free enterprise? Well, yeah, but no one made you be senator. Totally. Right. It's it's it is just not too much. to It's not remotely too much to ask. You know, it's this thing with uh, Matt, Matt Oz, you know, Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania. He's a dual citizen. And he's saying, well, I, OK, I won't I won't do some of the national security stuff if you don't if you don't want because, dual well, dude, first of all, I kind of well, I, I'm not going to get into my ideas about citizenship. But if you're going to be a senator, we want you playing only for our team. It's not too much to ask. Just be American. Don't be dual citizen. You know, you don't have to be senator. You don't have to be senator. Um, it is not a. It, it is. It is fine that you might have to give up a few things to be senator. You want to be president? Maybe you can't be in business anymore. At least for four years. That's not too much to ask. Yeah, I mean, at the very friggin' least, they should not be allowed to have stocks like that's just ridiculous <laughs> yeah i mean you know you can there's index funds and stuff like that a again if you're if you're so into playing the stock market awesome don't become a senator exactly. it's not too much to ask or put you know put your you know put it in a blind trust you know there's 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 people smarter about buying stocks than you right put it in a blind trust put it in an index fund probably make more money anyway unless you're trading on insider knowledge and kind of like you know no one made you be senator no one made you be president no one made you be uh representative all right so uh i think we are at the end pretty much of the show let me remind you that uh the josh marshall podcast brought to you by grady's cold brew iced coffee you can say 25 percent with 25 percent off with promo code tpm that's grady's cold brew.com uh, with promo code TPM. I guess that's right. it. See you next week. See ya. The Josh Marshall Podcast is hosted by me, TPM reporter Kate Riga, and TPM founder, editor-in-chief Josh Marshall. The show is produced by Jackie Wilhelm. Thanks to Why Not Dance Bell for our podcast theme song, and thanks to all our TPM members who make this possible. Rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, and subscribe wherever you listen.